Thank you for the love that we feel in this house this morning. It's overwhelming. We know it's eternal. And to think that we will experience that for eternity is mind-boggling at times. We just pray this morning, Lord, that the word of God will go forth as you designed it. And that, Father, you would speak your heart through my lips. And that your children, us as your sons and daughters, would receive it into our hearts. That it might bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm returning to uh, scriptures that I spoke on last week. And someone said, well, why would you do that? Well, it's mentioned three times in three different Gospels. So I guess Jesus thought it was important. So if he thought it was important, I think, I think it's important also. But of course, there's a different reflection on this sermon this morning than it was last week. My topic this morning is interruptions and distractions. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 22, an extreme situation is taking place. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, which he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. I want you to realize that this man had a high position in the synagogue. And for him to leave that religious environment and fall at the feet of Jesus is monumental. And he came with faith. He came saying, I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her. He had faith. And then he said that she may be healed and she shall live. He knew that his daughter was knocking on death's door. But yet he came. So you know, every word in the Bible has meaning. And Jairus, his name means the following. Whom God enlightens. I thought that was pretty rich. And this is exactly what Jesus was going to do for him. And we have to ask ourselves some questions this morning. You know, when you read the word of God, you should ask questions. Questions about yourself. What is God saying? What is the illumination that God wants to deliver to my soul? In what areas of life does God want to enlighten me? Jairus took a risk before his peers and admitted his need. Stop right there. He admitted his need. That's humility, my friend. He's a religious leader. He's a man that holds a place in the synagogue. He fell at the feet of Christ. And he says, Lord, I have a need. You see, it hit home. It hit home. It was his daughter. It was his flesh and blood. It was someone that was very, very close to his heart. He took a risk. Admitted his need. He was admitting he needed help. Now that sounds like a small statement. But a lot of people can't admit that they need help. He displayed humility and was not ashamed to come forth publicly. Being humble and asking for help is not a sin. You know what the sin is? Not asking for help. And a lot of people fall into that category because they say, I got this. I hate that. I got this. What do you have? Your best thinking has you where you are right now. Do you not need some help? It's okay to need help. It's okay when you're down on the ground to ask someone to extend their right hand and help you pick you up off the canvas, off the floor. It's okay. 
It's called humility. It's called being humble before God. And he says, those that humble themselves, he will exalt. But those that exalt themselves, God says he will dethrone. It's the word. An independent spirit, not under the control of the Holy Spirit, can be hazardous to your spiritual health. Say that again. An independent spirit. I got this spirit. I'm a survivor. An independent spirit, not under the control of the Holy Spirit, can be hazardous to your spiritual health. Amen. Psalm 46 and verse 1, the, pro, the psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Psalm 121 and verse 1. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. Isaiah 41 and 10 says this. Fear thou not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 10 and verse 12 says, Arise, O Lord, O God, and lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. There's a great deal to say about humility. The question this morning is this. Are we willing to take a healthy risk? and admit a need that might be in our life. I form this question to you this morning. What is bothering you? Simple. What do you have questions about? And what are you struggling with? You say, well, why do you ask those questions? Because that's what I do when I read the word of the Lord. I reflect upon myself and I say, Lord, am I willing to ha take a healthy risk? Am I willing to admit a need in my life before my peers? Lord, can I express what's bothering me, not only to you, Lord, but to the people of God that I trust? Lord, I have questions. We all have questions that we want answers to this morning. Some of you came with questions this morning. Some of you came with confusion this morning. Some of you came with upheaval in your homes this morning. And you want answers. What am I struggling with? What are you struggling with? You see, we don't like to address questions sometimes. We prefer denial. We prefer not to go there for fear what the Lord might say. But God wants to relieve our burdens. God wants to give us his rest. Interruptions and distractions happen to all of us. What is an interruption? It's a disruption. It's a pause. It's a stoppage. It's an interlude. A disturbance. It's an interval. It's a period of time that something happens and interrupts what we were doing. It's an intrusion. It's an intermission. It's like a commercial. It's a disconnection. What's a distraction? Distraction is a commotion, a diversion, an agitation, an anxiety, and a confusion. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, what interruptions are in our life right now? And what are some of the distractions that have come to us, even this morning, to take our minds away from the Lord? You see, the enemy has a goal. Amen. And that goal is to break intimacy with the Father. That's right. That goal is to break intimacy with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. The goal is division on the part of the enemy. That's right. The goal of God is unity, because that's his spirit. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, what's interrupting my life that I need to deal with? 
And one is disrupting my life and distracting me from the things that I need to be doing for God. Is it getting my focus off of the Lord? Ask yourself this morning, where is your focus? Where is your focus right now? Is our focus on what God wants to speak to our hearts? Or is it out there somewhere? Whose team is going to win? What am I going to eat for lunch? What am I going to do after church? Where's our focus? Mark chapter 5 and verse 25 says this, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, imagine being sick for 12 years, and suffered many things of many physicians, and spent all that she had and was none better, but grew worse. That's a terrible state to be in. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. You see, she received illumination. God enlightened her. Twelve years she struggled. I can't imagine the despair in that woman's life. I can't imagine the discouragement. I can't imagine the fear and the terror that was in that woman's life. And after twelve years, somehow she got an illumination from heaven. Somehow she got a memo from heaven. Somehow the Holy Spirit spoke into her heart and said, if you go down and touch the hem of Jesus, you will be made whole. Think of that for a moment. Here's a woman in distress for 12 years, and straightway she touched the hem of his garment. The fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. You know what a plague is? Amen. It destroys thousands and millions of people. A plague. She had a plague within her body. A physical plague. But there's a lot of people that have a spiritual plague in their body that's eating at them and destroying them day by day and daily because the enemy has come in to interrupt their walk with the Lord and distract them from intimacy with God. The Bible said, And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out, of him turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Who's willing this morning to touch his clothes? Who's willing this morning here in this place to touch the hem of his garment and have faith in God and believe God for the result? God's been speaking to my heart about unbelief. I saw one of the pastors post from World Challenge. We usually put those posts up on the app about unbelief the other day. And it verified in my heart what the Lord was saying. Do we really believe this? Do we really believe the word? Do we really walk in the word? Do we walk in that intimacy? Or do we say, oh, well, I've been interrupted and distracted. Maybe God isn't working today. Maybe he went on vacation. Doom and gloom, let's just give up. Let's call the coroner. Because it's over. No. No. You'll see. No. We have to believe. God is perfect. He never makes a mistake. And we have to go through the threshold. And sometimes we've got to bust down the door and knock down the hinges to get into the door to the presence of the Holy God. And say, God, I need you today. I'm in desperate need. My life is a shamble. It's out of control. I have no idea how to take this flood that's overwhelming me and what to do with it. It's like a dam has broken my life. I'm a needy person. The multitude was thronging, and he said, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, what a word from a dad. What a word from a father. What a word from an authority figure. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of the plague. 
Every dad wants his daughter in peace. Every dad wants to see his daughter or son in the rest of the Lord, in the peace of God. Take a moment, as I'm speaking to you this morning, take a moment and identify the interruptions and distractions in your life that you are experiencing presently. I know some of you come and you take notes. Write down some of those interruptions. Write down some of those distractions. Let the Lord know what they are. It's okay to put it on paper. It's okay to journal. It's okay to speak with the Lord about those interruptions and distractions. When our faith is challenged by an interruption, sometimes a crisis or a tribulation or a trial, we can become easily distracted. And we have to sort out the voices that are speaking to our spirit. It's so important to sort out the voices because there's a lot of voices in the earth. The Bible says it in the book of Hebrew. There are many voices in the earth, but there's one voice that speaks and there's one voice that the sheep hear and it's the voice of Christ. It's the voice of the shepherd. It's the voice of the bishop of our soul. That's the voice. That wants to be heard above all voices. We have to sort out the interruptions and the distractions and evaluate them spiritually. Lord, what does this mean? What should I do? What's the plan? What's the order of business? Show me in the word. Show me how to walk. Show me what I need to do. What are you saying? You see, God sees things to the end. We just see things in segments. He sees the entire thing that you're going through this morning. And he has a plan. And the plan is always this, my friend, to bring you to the other side. Hear what I just said. The plan is always to bring you to the other side of where you are right now. You forget that sometimes. Because we see ourselves as the disciples drowning in the boat, bailing water. We see ourselves as weaklings at times when we have the resurrected power of God in our lives. We don't see Jesus walking toward the boat in the middle of the night. We don't see Christ walking to the church. We don't even see him anymore walking toward our country because people have given up. They've thrown in the towel. They say, what's the use? That may be good for you, but it's not good for your children or your grandchildren. You see, we could say that we have all that we need right now, but what about our children and our grandchildren? Do we throw in the towel for them too? To experience all the nonsense that's going on? Or do we hold on to the horns of the altar and believe God and His Word and say, God, you said you'll do a new thing. Yes. You said, God, you'll give me a new song in my mouth. Yes. Lord, you said if I praise you and worship you, O oh God, that the power of God would come down. Lord, we are the Jairuses of this world, God, and we need to be enlightened, O oh God, and we need to be illuminated, O oh God, by the Word of the Lord, and we need revelation this morning, O oh God, on how to conduct ourselves and how to move forward through this maze of life. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Romans 8, 28, do we believe it? And we know that all things... What are you going through this morning? What are you going through this morning? It's not all peaches and cream. I know that. For none of us. But he says the word. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Does that mean that I have to love all those things? No. 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 But God is my partner. And he has a plan for my life. And he is working out the details. 
This doesn't mean I am going to like everything happening in my life right now, but by faith, I'm going to believe God. He's going to use each thing for my benefit and bring me to a spiritual place where I belong. And that's the bottom line, my friend, for God to bring you to that spiritual place where you belong right now. Bad news. This lady was healed. Jairus is walking home with Jesus, with the disciples. But while he yet spake, there came from the rulers of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? People love bad news. I said, People love bad news. Bad news sells. It's called yellow journalism. You didn't read on social media this morning the kid that's succeeding. You didn't read on social media this morning the family that's coming to the house of God on a regular basis. No, it's bad news. It's bad news. You see, the enemy will say when bad news comes, and we will all get bad news at times, he says this to us. Don't trouble God with this because it's too late. Don't trouble God. He's busy. He has other things to do. He will declare that your problem is not important and has no solution. That's what the naysayers say. Yes, bad news will come to all of us one time or another. But what bad news is in your life in this very moment? What is the bad news? We've got to bring it to Jesus. You see, we hold on to the bad news. We talk about the bad news. We elevate the bad news. We exalt the bad news. What will you do with it? What are you doing with the bad news this morning? Can God turn bad news into good news? The Bible we talk about is the good news. The good news. Do we really believe all things work together for good that love God? Do we really believe that we have a puzzle in our life that God is putting together and sometimes that puzzle gets interrupted by a distraction but God says, listen, I've got the puzzle piece that will fit. You all know the story of Joseph in the Bible. Looked pretty bleak for that young man for quite a long time. Sold into slavery, set up by Potiphar's wife, went to jail. <laughs> we get a paint somewhere. We're ready to declare war on God. Oh God, don't you see what I'm going through? Sold into slavery, thrown into a pit while his brothers were eating lunch. Kept there to die until the Ishmaelites came and bought him. He went through hell and high water, but became the second most powerful person in the world. And when there was a famine in the land, who did God give wisdom to? The one that was rejected by his family, his brothers, his household, but not rejected by God. You see, he had a lot of bad news coming into his life. The Bible says, and I want to read four different versions for a purpose. Genesis chapter 15, verse 20, he said this to his brothers. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. In the HCSD version it says, you planned evil against me. That's what he told his brothers. God gave him power of voice. You got to find your voice sometimes. And you have to speak your voice. And sometimes when you speak your voice, people are going to get upset. Jesus spoke his voice. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. 
Because the word divides people and they don't want truth and they don't want their sin revealed. But don't let someone plunder you. Don't let someone overpower you with their brashness or their voice. Making you think they're more powerful than you. My friend, we need to find our voice in this world. We are not weak Christians. And don't take meekness for weakness. And when we do retort against people, immediately say, well, I thought you were a Christian. Yes, I am, but I am not a doormat. Genesis 50 and 20 in the NLT version says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I can save the lives of many people. And in the NLT version again, as for you, you devised evil against me. God devised it for good in order to do as this day to keep alive a numerous people. When you look at the life of Joseph, you have to model. He never gave up. He never threw in the towel. He was accused of something he didn't do. He went to jail. Spent years in jail. Who would think that God would redeem Joseph to do what he did in the earth with the wisdom that he had to store food and to save thousands and thousands of people from starving? The naysayers came and said to Jairus, it's too late. I like Jesus' response in Mark 5, 36. And I'm going to read four different versions again. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, as soon as he heard it, what do you do when the words are spoken that are negative? What do you do with them? He saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. Which implies the spirit of fear now is entering. See, God gave him a command. God was saying, don't pay attention to what you just heard. Just trust me. Don't let these words affect you spiritually. Keep confident and dependent on Christ. In the Amplified version of that same verse, it says, overhearing, this is Jesus, but ignoring what they said. You know, sometimes it's called planned ignoring. It's true. Sometimes when I worked at the home for seven years in Cuba home, some of the kids were acting out, seeking negative attention when we wanted to give them positive attention. We just assumed the cloak of planned ignoring. I'm not listening, I'm not hearing, I'm not interested. When you want to be civil, you can come back and then we can talk. Until then, have a great day. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? No. When you take the wood off the fire, the fire goes out. When you add wood to the fire and you contribute to it, it escalates like you're throwing gasoline with a match. In the message version, it says, Jesus overheard what they were talking about and said to the leader, don't listen to them, just trust me. In the RSV version, it says, but ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. You know, the one big tactic of the enemy is to bring fear to our lives. Amen. Fear about tomorrow. Fear about next week. Fear about two years from now. Fear about this and fear about that. It's a mechanism that he uses to paralyze us spiritually. Fear. That's why there's so many times in the Bible that the Lord said, fear not. Fear not. What instructions? You see, Jesus was giving Jairus instructions. Don't pay attention to what you just heard. Simple. What instructions and commands are you hearing from God concerning what you are experiencing right now? What's the instruction for you? What's God saying? Not what you're saying, not what you're thinking. What is the Spirit of the Lord saying to you? What is He outlining for you as a course of action? Hmm. 
What is he commanding you to do by his voice speaking to your heart and by what he says in the word of God? Are you looking in the word for a solution? Are you looking in the word of God for the answer? Do you need help in a course of action? And are you willing to ask someone for that course of action to help you? That's crossing the threshold. That's entering the door. That's becoming humble and saying, God, I have a need. So what did Jesus do? He kept on walking. And sometimes, you know, you've got to keep on walking from certain people. Right. At least for a season. That's right. Because they are there for your detriment sometimes. Sometimes you have to say, hey, we're not eating right now together. We're not drinking coffee together. Because I need a rest. And I need to take a walk for myself. Even if you bundle up with your hat and your gloves and your coat and you go for a walk on the road or somewhere that's safe, say, I got to go get some fresh air. Because the air in here is stale. It's like stale oil. It smells. It stinks. And when it gets on you, it's hard to get off. Get a stain of oil on your clothes and it's very difficult to remove. Jesus gave him instructions, and as he started walking in Mark 5, 37, and he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of Jesus. He permitted no one to follow him. He didn't allow anyone to follow him. He was saying, stay away. Stay away. Sometimes women go to court to get one of those stayaways from an abusive person. Why? Because they're negative. They're abusive. They want to bring the person down. They want to humiliate a female. Shame on them. It's a stay away clause. The judge signs off on it. Jesus signed off that day with Jairus. And he said, stay away don't need you following me, don't need you barking into the ears of this man, we're on a mission. Then Jesus stopped the crowd in the NLT version and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Sometimes you have to put your foot down. Sometimes you have to tell people, this is the way it is. You may not like it, but this is my stand. You see, there are times when we cannot permit or allow certain people into our sheepfold. They want to interrupt the plan of God in your life. The plan. What's your plan? What is God saying to your heart this morning? Get along with Jesus is so important so you won't be distracted by the voices around you. That's what Jesus was doing. He took the three disciples and got along with the parents and went into that house and closed the door. Sometimes you have to shut the door. Mm -hmm. To shut out the voices. Mm -hmm. Because all those voices want to do is bring you down. <clears throat> Getting along with Jesus is important. Sometimes you must take yourself away from every voice except Jesus. Other times you must allow God to assemble an inner circle of trusted Christians who you can trust to give you spiritual direction. Understand what God is saying here. Who did he bring into the inner circle? Peter, James, and John for a purpose. And we have to find the inner circle in our life. Because you're going to need that inner circle at times. When those interruptions and distractions turn into a crisis, a trial, and a fiery tribulation, Amen. who are you going to go to? That's right. Are you going to say, I got this, when you don't got this? That's a flat-out lie from the devil. Amen. None of us got this alone. That's right. Because that's why God created the body in the local church. That's why he created families to love one another. 
to help one another, to speak into the spirit of one another and not destroy the spirit. So Jesus comes upon the house and what does he find? Oh, just what we find today, Mark 5, 38. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult. What's the tumult? The disturbance, the clamor, the uproar, the wailing, the frightening environment. Oh my, listen to this. And then that wept and wailed greatly outside this man's house. Is this exactly what this man needs right now? Is this lifting his spirit? Is this encouraging him? Absolutely not. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? Why, why are you demonstrating out here? What, 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 do you, what do you do? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Oh, boy, that really brought some laughter. And they laughed him to scorn in verse 40 of Mark 5. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. You see, people are going to laugh at your faith. Amen. Especially in the last day. You see, Daniel said that God desires for us to do exploits in the last days. And people are going to laugh at that. They're going to laugh that we can move in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that we can be a, a remnant believer or a remnant church. And come to the doorstep of the devil and do miracles. That's right. Through his name, Christ. <laughs> Amen. Your family has laughed at you because you came a, became a Christian. They mocked you. They ridiculed you. Friends that you thought were friends left you immediately once they saw you toting the Bible and going to church a few times a week. Is there, have you lost your mind? No, I found Christ. I found my mind. Let's put my life back together piece by piece. And I'm going to trust him for the result. You see, what Jesus was saying was this. She was dead, but not permanently dead. Follow. She was dead, but not permanently dead. Amen. You see, sometimes we must bring Jesus those things that are dead, but not permanently dead, because he decides what gets resurrected. That's right. Amen. Ah. Say that again. She was dead. Yes. But not permanently dead. That's right. This was the message to the scorners that was laughing at Jesus. And sometimes we must bring Jesus those things that are dead, but not permanently dead, because he decides what gets resurrected. He said in John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, I bring it forth much fruit. Amen. See, the enemy takes the dream out of the life of people. He takes the very life out of people. He brings people to a place of despair and negativity and sarcasm and cynicism. It's a spirit. That's right. And you hear it. And it's like, wow. And sometimes you have to ask yourself a question. Are you really going to like heaven if you get there? Mm. <laughs> Are you really going to enjoy heaven when you get there? Are you going to enjoy the music? Are you going to enjoy the fellowship and the love? Are you going to enjoy that? Because it doesn't seem anything on this earth makes you happy. Too much rain, too much snow, too cold, too warm, too this, too that. Wow. High maintenance. Have you ever come across a high maintenance person? Oh, man, they are hard to get over. Woo. High 
my means. You can't do much to make them happy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. It's like you got to jump through hoops for them. And heaven forbid if you'd say one little thing that they perceive as, oh, man, you are in the doghouse now, and you're getting bit by that dog. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to live my life like that. Propping people up all the time. Watching every word I say, everything I do. It's like, get on with life, people. What's the issue? What's the problem? Get over yourself. That's what God is saying. Get over yourself. You're not the sun. You're not a star. You're not a planet. No one's revolving around you. How'd you get so lofted high? That's exactly what happened to Satan. His pride lofted him really high. And people don't see pride sometimes. They think they're all that. And we're not. When we get to the point, point when we think we're that, and we're doing this, we're in trouble. Amen. We're in real trouble. What's God saying? God was saying this. Watch out for interruptions and distractions while you're on your way to the solution. Very important. Because you're going to meet up with the minstrels. <laughs> Who are the minstrels in your life? Ask yourself that question right now. Who are the minstrels singing sad songs outside your door or maybe inside your house? As God is unfolding his plan to you, don't be surprised when the minstrels show up in your life. Identify those who laugh at you because of your faith. Identify those that pat you on the head like a dog and appease you like you're a piece of junk. Don't pat me on the head like I'm a dog because I'm not a dog. I only have two legs, not four. Mm -hmm. You may not like me, but I'm not a dog. Mm -hmm. And I don't need no pats on the head. Mm -hmm. Not in God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. He created dogs to be companions for people. And they're wonderful companions. I love dogs. Consider the source and decide to put them all out as Jesus did. You see, sometimes you have to take a stand. And that's hard. Sometimes you have to separate yourself from nonsense. Because it's destroying. They will confuse and distract you from the solution. <clears throat> Eliminate negative people who desire to reign on your parade and who lack faith. Misery loves company. <clears throat> and who do miserable people fellowship with? Other miserable people to agree with them. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. This misery is good, man. It's like a pot of good stew, but it's got poison in it. Mark 5:41, it says, and he took the damsel by the hand. This is very important. And he said to her, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. He just spoke. As he spoke the world into existence. Do we really believe that? For she was of age 12, 12 years old. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. And commanded that something should be given her to eat. Hmm. He took her by the hand. Let God take those things by the hand. Put your hand in his this morning. You see, Jesus spoke to death and it reversed its course. Sometimes we have to speak to the death in our lives in the name of Jesus, asking him to bring forth life and restoration. Sometimes we have to speak that life. Life restored. 
Though your life has experienced a series of interruptions and distractions, perhaps, Jesus can restore your life to his plan. Jesus always has a plan. He always has a plan. There's a prophetic plan that's unfolding in the earth, and people are desperately trying to figure it out. Trying to figure out when World War III is coming. When's the temple going to be rebuilt? Is it going to be the temple, or is it going to be the tabernacle that's restored? What, what's it going to be? The temple would take a long time, but the tabernacle can only be a tent. We're trying to figure out all these things. And we're being distracted by not allowing God to illuminate our daily practical living as Christians. So if you knew when World War III was going to start, how would that change your life right now? Tell me. If you knew when the tribulation was going to begin, how would that change your life right now? Would you do anything different? For some people, no. For a lot of people, no. There's no trial, no tribulation, no situation, no circumstance or problem that's too hard for God. You see, the enemy has arisen in our minds to make us think, God can't solve this. It's too big. God is always looking for an opportunity to come on the scene and make a supernatural difference. You see, you know the, the problem that exists? The problem that exists is this. We try to solve it carnally when God wants to solve it supernaturally because he's a supernatural God. So we sit down and we map out the plan. We map out the plan for our kids, for our families, without ever asking the Lord, what's your plan for this situation or this person? You see, we try to live our life through others. It's a dangerous position sometimes if you're not careful. Because what dream didn't come through in your life don't try to invoke that on someone that's your kid. Amen. It doesn't work. Yeah. Every child's different. Every child's unique. Yeah. But God has given us power and authority. We must invite his presence into every detail of our life. Christ is ready, willing, and able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Amen. Look what happened here. The spirit left the 12-year-old girl's body and as you've heard me preach many times, traveled down the corridor of time. But when Jesus spoke to her and said, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. That spirit that left her body heard Christ and did a turnaround and walk right back and slip right back into that body through the command and the voice of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to ask you a question this morning. Has the voice of Christ dimmed any since the resurrection? Is his voice not as strong as it used to be? His voice is strong. He's capable. But are we capable to believe the word? Mark chapter 1 verse 30. Jesus came into Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law. That'll throw some people through a loop. I mean Peter had a wife? Yeah. He had a mother-in-law. How do you do that without a wife? I know they want to make him the first pope. I thought they weren't able to get married in that church. Uh-oh. 
Being his mother-in-law. Was sick in bed with a high fever. And they told Jesus about her right away. And so he went to her bedside. And took her by the hand. And helped her sit up. And the fever left her. And she prepared a meal for them. In Mark 11 verse 23. For verily I say unto you. That whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Be thou removed. And be thee cast into the sea. And shall not doubt in his heart. But shall believe those things. Which the Lord saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatever he saith. He said say sometimes to the mountain. No. Gotta find your voice. Sometimes you have to find your voice. And tell people, stop, you're the mountain. Just stop. In Mark 8, 22, and he came to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand. And led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and he said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. He took him by the hand. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in the Lord, Sometimes we have to take each other by the hand, the right hand of fellowship, and say to a brother or a sister, I'm with you. Amen. I'm in your corner. I have your back. I may not have the immediate solution for you, but know this. I will cover you. I will be there no matter what. That's comforting. In the book of Mark chapter 9 and verse 20. And they, they brought unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the, the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long has it been since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes he cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe... All things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Perhaps that should be our prayer sometimes. Lord, I believe, but he said, help thou my unbelief. You see, sometimes in a little space, you get that momentary doubt, that hesitation. Mm -hmm. If I pray this prayer, will it work? If I lay hands on people, will they get healed? As I said last week, I'm not the healer. I just do what the Bible says. It's up to him. And sometimes that little twinge, that little voice, says, do you really believe that? Do you think that's really going to happen? When he, Jesus saw the people came running together, he, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter him into him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was one as dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. <coughs> One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the crippled man at the gate, beautiful. He was left here every day since birth to be a beggar. This beautiful backdrop, a beautiful gate. People passing by with their dusty sandals and blowing dust in his face. And he was hoping that he would get a, a thin dime maybe to get something to eat. Someone would have to go get for him. Day after day, despair, futility, discouragement, fear, rejection, abandonment. Until a couple of the disciples came by and took a look at him 
and said, hey, wait. We can, we can help this man. You ever come upon someone and say to yourself in your spirit, I know I can help him in Christ. His faith while it was up. His spirit just comes to the surface. surface. And you say, I just know if I had an opportunity in Christ, giving God the glory, I, I, I believe God can touch him. Peter and John saw him and said, silver and gold have I none. I don't have any money to give you, sir. But such as I have, what do you have? What do you have this morning? What do you have? What do we have? But such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name. Oh. In the name. The enemy hates that name. It's the name whereby man can be saved. Amen. Where demons flee by the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He said, rise up and walk. Amen. Whoa, that's going through the threshold. That's taking a healthy risk. That's busting down the doors with the hinges coming off. I'm sure the enemy of their soul said, what did you just say? What did you just speak? And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Why? Because God had a plan for the crippled man. And Peter and John said, get up! Get away from the gate. Get away from the gate. Amen. He was at the gate. They were telling him, get away from the gate. And there's too many people that are always near the gate. That's right. Always on the street corner. Always with the group. Always with the same type. Let's get high. Let's go rob a store. Let's go rob a car. Always near the gate. And they bring other people to the gate. One by one. Come on, man. Don't you want to party? Come on, I got a little something for you. Come on. You've been under a lot of stress. Come on. Trust me. I'm your friend. No, you're a lion spirit, devil, foul spirit is what you are. Bringing people to the doors of hell is what you're doing. Let me close. I've selected these verses to close for a reason. Psalm 16 and 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be you might be going through a tumultuous storm right now and you might be saying pastor how can you even recite that verse because I can't by faith he says in Psalm 16 11 you will show me the path of life even though there's fog out there even though there's a storm you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Psalm 17 and 7 says, Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. O oh, you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Psalm 18 and 35 you have also given me the shield of your salvation. And your right hand has held me up. And your gentleness 
has made me great. Psalm 20 and verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Amen. Isaiah 41 and 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Amen. And Isaiah 41, 13 to close. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. No matter how bleak it looks right now. No matter how ominous life looks. God says, I will help thee. I believe it. I believe the promises. Amen. Circumstances don't always dictate that saying everything is going the way you want to. But if you hold on, listen to me as I close. If you hold on, if you allow someone to take you by the right hand, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, if you allow the Lord to take you by the right hand and lift you up, I guarantee you, the plan will unfold. It took a long time in the life of Joseph. It took a long time in the life of Noah. It took a long time for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea. It took a long time. But God enacted the plan at the end because he sees it from beginning to end. We just see life in segments. Don't get stuck in the segment. Don't get stuck in the interruption or the distraction. Don't get stuck in the intermission. It's just a commercial. The show will continue. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word this morning. Thank you for the depthness of your spirit that we so desire to touch. And thank you, Lord, this morning that we can come and touch the hem of your garment. And be healed in the name of Jesus. Father, no matter what we're going through this morning, we know that your main desire is to bring us to the other side. And Father, we thank you for bringing us to the other side. Even when the ship is full of water and the winds are blowing and the storm is raging, you take us by the right hand and you lift us up, especially when we're in trouble. I pray your blessing upon this sermon this morning as people would listen or view it. I ask God for your divine intervention in the lives of those in this church, Lord, that need a helping hand this morning to be lifted up above the shadows of the earth, above the dark clouds, and to hear the voice of God, I will help thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us?